Polling and Politics. Dr. Frank Luntz in Conversation. A podcast from the Shaping a Better World series. Even the two of you there, if you guys can come down a little bit closer because I want to make eye contact with you all. Uh, this is part of, of communications, part of, of understanding how people think and how they think. This is an edited version of a conversational event organized by the Queen's Public Engagement Directorate and Queen's Politics Society, recorded on Thursday, 5th of May, 2022. We've never been so divided as we are right now in America. We have never been so angry with each other. We asked a very simple question, and it's of people of your age. Have you written someone out of your life? Have you stopped talking to them because you disagree with them about their politics? And I was shocked to find that more than 50% of those 18 to 24 have that I always thought that you were the most tolerant generation, that you were the most willing to hear things that you disagreed with. As you go up in age, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, less and less people are writing people out. And more and more of them are with people who disagree with them and a willingness to hear points of view that they don't necessarily want to adopt. What I don't understand is why don't people who I uh, just realized I'm making your, your video thing really difficult. <laughs> but this is because I want to be as close to them as I can. Why don't you sit with people who don't look like you? Why don't you engage with people who don't look like you? This is what universities are all about, the opportunity to learn and experience and grow and establish friendships and relationships that have an impact long after you're here. The students that I went to school with at the university, now I'm going to go over here, so now you're going to be driven crazy. <laughs> you should have, you should have, someone should have asked you this before, because I want to be as close as I can. Not spinning close, but as close as possible. Lunts on friendship. My friendships continue to this day, and I graduated from university 35 years ago. We have the same group of 11 kids who are now old and we still get together every single year and we don't agree on anything and we all go back to our childhood disagreements we all go back to who we were some of us have been successful some of us not so much so the single thing that i advise students more than anything else in life pick the people who you really enjoy and make a commitment to gather together every single year because it really does matter on my way here, I flew from L.A. I watched the movie Belfast. Lunts on Belfast. I watched the film coming here, and I'd been here a couple times before. And every time that I've come here, I've had the chance to experience your NHS. And I find it a horrible coincidence that every single time I've been in Northern Ireland, I've been in a hospital in Northern Ireland. So there's clearly something that is not good luck for me or for Northern <laughs> Ireland. And your hospitals are cleaner than ours are. Uh, I think I got serviced faster than they would in the US. And I think I got better care. But um, the movie was very troubling, obviously. And some people say it's accurate. Some people say it's not. It's not as dramatic. It's not as gritty as it was back then. I get into the car of the gentleman who's taking me to this university and I try to talk him up about politics. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to engage me. And I tried a couple times and he turns me down. And then we cross over into town and he turns around. He's at a stoplight, so don't be nervous. And he says, can I have a conversation with you, just you and me? I said, of course. He said, do you see that bridge over there? Yeah. My father was walking over that bridge. I was seven years old. My father was murdered. This gentleman was Catholic, murdered by a, uh, a Protestant agitator. I don't know what words you use for them. If I use the wrong words, I apologize for it. And he said it, I to lose my dad at seven. And I saw what it did to my mom, what it did to our family. And for the rest of the ride, he actually did talk, not politics of who's running right now, but the seriousness of what had happened. And I was very grateful to him. So then I'm trying to tell that story to the person who checked me into my hotel. I'm staying at the Wellington. And I couldn't. 
because my voice kept quivering. I could not explain it without being emotional. And the gentleman who's checking me in says, there's got to be something else. We've all known this has existed. You knew it. What is it? Why are you so upset? I said, I'm upset because this is a seven-year-old kid who loses his father in a senseless, brutal, criminal act. He says, no, there's got to be something else. And I thought about it for a bit. How old are you? About 20. You, your best years ahead of you? Hopefully. <laughs> are Northern Ireland's best years ahead of it? Maybe. Only maybe? Mm. Why only maybe? Because it's such a turbulent place. You never know what's next around the corner. In my country, we never had that doubt. In my country, the next generation was always going to be better off than the previous one. Mm. It was a guarantee. It's part of the American dream that your kids live a better life than you. So as I'm thinking about it, trying to steady my voice, I suddenly realized there was a reason why I was so upset. And I don't know if any of you are American here, and it's very hard for me to admit this, but I'm scared to death that we will end up as you. That the divisions and the anger are getting more and more overt, are getting more and more physical. Someone jumped into the audience. I don't know how many of you know the comedian uh, Dave Chappelle, but he was tackled in one of his performances because someone didn't like what he had to say. Then we see violence at some of the Trump rallies in 2016 and 2020. I see what happened at Black Lives Matters rallies on the other side. Buildings burned, people attacked, beaten up. I don't want the troubles in America because I know what could happen. And so I stand in front of you to tell you a little bit about, about politics and polls. But I do so not just with humility, but with fear about where we are headed and what social media does to us. And I was told, don't be so negative, don't depress people. I'm looking around and you're all going, you want to end it right now. Well, this room is so colorful that, that I figure just the, the, de the decor of this room will get you through this presentation. I moderate focus groups every single week. I'll be doing one, I believe, tomorrow night. I do surveys every other week. I talk to more people in more states, potentially in more countries than anybody else. And everything I hear is about division. And everything I hear is about rejection, is about their ruining our country. It's always they. Never is it a matter of personal responsibility. What more can I do? So I wanted to be here. I was at your hospital for the last six hours dealing with something going on in my head. Um, and there's no way that they were going to keep me from doing this. Because I want to know from you what you think your future is. I want to know from you how you evaluate the U.S. and how you eva evaluate your own government. So I'm going to point out, I'm going to work across this row. I'm going to start with you because they're the most people. We'll go all the way across. Lunch on President Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden ran as Harry Truman. Ran as a centrist uniter. He sought to govern as Franklin Roosevelt, a genuine progressive, a really change-oriented progressive. And his administration has been probably the same thing as Jimmy Carter, and no better, and perhaps even worse. When you look at it, and you look at how the American, the divisions that existed in November of 2020 are much worse today. The economy, the handling of COVID, but probably the most impactful with him is Afghanistan and then Iraq and what he does in Iran. Because in the end, the public looked at what happened and as much as they, and this is where it's always tough because when you're president, you're often given eight different choices and every one of them is awful. The American public had enough of Afghanistan. They wanted the U.S. out. They want to see any more people die. They didn't want to spend any more money. <clears throat> but Biden made the decision to leave just in time for the 20th anniversary. And whenever you make a decision, and I say this to you because I want to teach you life lessons in this, you can make a good decision for wrong reasons, and that good decision becomes a bad one. 
He wanted to celebrate the U.S. being out of Afghanistan. He wanted to do it on the 20th anniversary of the invasion, of 9, I should say, of 9-11. And by doing it that way, people were left behind. We watched chaos. He kept saying to his troops, I don't want another Vietnam. And yet, what do we see at the airport? The planes and the people jumping on and people falling off. You had worse than Vietnam. And when you're going to do sanctions to try to keep a country from invading another country, you do the sanctions before the invasion, not after. And yet, he's managed to unite the world. Here's a guy who was stuck in the U.S. for most of the, his first year in the White House because of COVID. NATO was stronger than it's ever been. There's greater cooperation between us and our Asian allies that sometimes if you have someone in office who's just America first, America first, America first, it ends up being America last because nobody else is willing to jump on board. Nobody else is willing to align themselves with the U.S. Luntz and Monica McWilliams on the Good Friday Agreement. So you have someone significant in your midst right here. We were talking yesterday. She's a signer of the Good Friday Agreement. And I got to sit next to her. And I was going to have to move people all around to be able to have the chance to do this. Because I think it is so effing awesome, that agreement, that it was so impossible. Too many people had too many resentments and there was too much revenge and all those R words that are ugly <clears throat> rather than reconciliation and reconstruction and rejuvenation. The R words are either negative or positive, but they're the most powerful of all. And if you can do that, why can't we? So I'll tell you something. I want this place, this university, I really believe in this, to set up a, a, your faculty here. Who's faculty here? Nobody. One right there. Your faculty? I, I would love to see this place be the home of conflict resolution for the globe. That this is the place where people come instead of Norway, which is really, really cold, which is even colder than here. <clears throat> Though it does rain a little bit less there than it does here. Queen's University should be the home of conflict resolution because you all have lived through it. You've all experienced it, some, sometimes in a very bad way. And I think if you can do what you have done, which isn't perfect, and there's a lot of crap under the surface, which I did not understand. But if you can get it done, so can every other society. So I've learned that there's a there's a curiosity that I think has to be shared with the world and a willingness to put the past behind to try to find a better future. I'm going to ask you this question, if you can give her the mic. Here we go. <laughs> what it, no, because it's the same thing. I'm, I wanted to be here because I so believe in conflict resolution and this may not have been who I was 20 years ago. If those of you looked up my background and you read some of the stuff I'd done, first off, some of it's not true. Secondly, some of the stuff that is true, this is 20 years ago, and that's not who I am now. What can we learn from Northern Ireland that the US and the world can take to make us all better people? And you are more qualified to answer this than anyone else I know of. I think that conversation we just had earlier is a very good example of your preparedness to say what you thought was different from what you said. And that's what we did at that table. And But nobody was listening for a long time, um, until the last few days. Um, so dialogue, listening, we're great talkers. Um, and then being accepted, accepting you weren't going to get everything, that you were going to have to give up something. And some of that's painful. 
Um, and patience, persistence, taking a few risks, challenging your own side, um, being the kind of leader that you would aspire others to be, and um, building friendships with people that you never dreamed would become like family. Which is why it's so important for you to dine with people who don't look like you. <clears throat> if you refuse to do that, if your friends are the same friends that you've had 20, 10 years ago, then you don't grow, you don't learn, you don't experience. I love NYU Abu Dhabi, that's where I teach now, because 86% of the university is not the home culture. It's not Emirati, 86%. So when you sit at a table, even if you want to, you can't sit with only people of your kind. You have to be global in, in your perspective. And you said something which I want to emphasize because it's the answer to your first question. Rather than focusing on what you give up, you need to focus on what you get. And no one ever does that perspective. So if, if someone can write that down to give it to me because I forget some of the stuff I say, but that's something, it's the Beatles song. Uh, in the and in the end, love you make is equal to love you take is equal to love you make. This is similar to that. It's not what you get. It's not what you give up. It's what you get. That would be very helpful to us. Uh, you have no idea how much that makes me. That's like balm to me. Frank, equally last night I went home and thought about something you said, and it's been said here too by people who won't like the outcome of some decisions that we might have to face in the future. And you said you were really scared that Trump might get back in again. And then you said something that many of us have done, but then came back. You said, I'm getting out. I'm going to leave. And I thought about that last night, and I thought every country needs people like yourself to stay. So if you did leave, would you come back? Because um, it puzzled me a great deal to think <clears throat> that well, everything you've been through and everything you've seen about conflict resolution, that you can't see a way through and that you wouldn't be part of the solution. And that's always been the issue for me is, is to find the solution. My life is a jigsaw puzzle, and this is how I look at it. And every day is a new puzzle, and every day I have to put that puzzle back. And the reason why... I enjoy life is because I get to do it again and again and again. I'm never bored. I was bored in the hospital for six hours today. Other than that, that challenge of putting together a new puzzle, and I don't even know what it looks like. When I wake up, I've got no idea what's going to happen, but I know that something's going to happen and I need to figure it out. The issue that I have with the U.S. is that I can't get around it, and the reason why I can't is social media. If you cannot control integrity and honesty, then I don't know where you go from there. Maybe one of you can explain this to me because I don't know. How do you bring about change if you don't trust the people who are giving you the information and you don't trust what you're reading or consuming? If you lack that trust, there's no one in here if I think that, that um, you're not going to hurt me that I can't get something good out of our relationship. No one, even if you hate America, even if you're all the way on the left, all the way on the right, but if I'm afraid of you, then I can't get anything from you. I can't benefit from you and you can't benefit from me. So that's the situation in the States. I can't wrap my head around it because he'll say anything. Doesn't matter, the truth doesn't matter to him. And that's beyond I've been people I really dislike, but at least we knew the truth. Now we don't know the truth. Lunch on the U.S. presidential election 2024. There's no way. Joe Biden will be 86 years old at the end of his second term if he were to run. He will not run. The Democratic Party will not let him run. But here's a number for you, for you to consider. Kamala Harris is the lowest approval rating of a vice president in office than any since Dan Quayle in 1990. It's been 30 years since someone had a lower approval rating. I used to think that she was surely gonna be the next president. 
and I don't believe so anymore. If Trump runs, I don't know how you beat him. If you watch the primaries yesterday, we're going to see all through this month uh, candidates that he in endorsed. They're going to lose in Georgia. He'll lose the governor's race in Georgia, which is the one he wants to win the most because he's angry at that governor because that governor did his job. Um, but Trump is the most powerful person in the GOP. And if he wants the nomination, I believe he will get it. And I, th I just think, and I'm watching the, the primaries now, the ugliness, the advertising. And I was going to show you some of this. Just go on YouTube and type in G Republican primary advertising, and you'll see how ugly it is, how personal, destructive, vicious. It's really awful. Is and it, and I don't want to see that come to Ireland. I don't want to see you guys following. And I watched the last debate. And you guys are starting to use the same tactics. Thank God you don't have a Donald Trump. Because the single worst moment in my lifetime in American politics was Trump in that first debate when he would not shut up. And I was in the room. I was in the chamber. And the debaters were no farther away from me than you are right now. I mean, the presidential debate was this close to me. So I could have stood up without a microphone and said, I'm going to, you're going to yell at me. I should not do this. But I was actually thinking of saying, Mr. President, would you just shut the up? Because he wouldn't. And he kept interrupting the moderator, interrupting the, the vice president. But I looked around and there were too many security people with it as far away. So I'd be yelling at you and the security people were sitting right there. And I did not want to get tackled and have my neck broken. I just didn't want to go to jail. Not, at least not then. The, the, the buffets after these presidential debates are really, really good. Mm -hmm. And I was hungry. And if I went to jail, I would not be able to eat for 24 hours. So I didn't do it. I really thought of doing it. Um, America does not want a rerun of that campaign at all. Trump does. Nobody else does. Lunch on the U.S. Democratic Party. The reason why I got elected, frankly, was the failure of the Democratic Party. So many working class Americans who have been told that they have your back, they will be your voice, they will ensure that you get everything that you got coming to you. And after decade after decade of being told this, they looked at Hillary Clinton and said, you don't get me. You don't understand me. Your, I hate to use this word privilege, but your privilege, and Trump, who actually is privilege, spoke their language, spoke their, their um, not English, spoke their American. And when people say to me that they're really angry that Trump got elected, I say, look at yourself in the mirror. Why did Trump win? Not because he was strong, but because Hillary Clinton was weak. And if you don't want this again here, you have to speak up, you have to speak out. You, number one, you demand the truth. Number two, which is almost as important, which is you listen. She is a machine of putting out information. She is not a machine for collecting it. Think of how much time, I don't know how, what your classes are like, but we've been talking for about 40 minutes now, I think, and how much time has been you versus me. Now look at her and the type of campaign she ran. There was nothing from the audience. There was nothing from the people. They didn't even know whether she thought they existed. And there's this thing, I'm with her. This is a Trump line from the convention. I'm with her. That was her slogan, with an arrow. So I'm backing her. Trump said, I'm with you. Turn it right around. You get it. Brilliant. If you want to be effective in politics, if you want to win your argument and your argument about the future of this this, uh, what do you call it? Because you're not a country. Region. This region is better. You talk about it in terms of your audience, not in terms of yourself. You talk about it in terms of people you want to reach. And Trump did that all the time. Now, the problem with Trump was it wasn't always honest, and it was always brutal. And he taught people to resent others, or at least he reflected that resentment. And that's part of my biggest fear is that on both sides we're promoting resentment. On both sides, the left is doing exactly the same thing. Elizabeth Warren, 
Bernie Sanders, AOC, resentment of corporate America. The very people who hire tens of millions of people and they want you to hate them. They want you to hate anyone who's a small c conservative. It doesn't work on either side. And one last point about this. My problem, America's problem, is that we all see what other people are doing, but we don't see it from ourselves. We all see the hostility and, oh, if only we could get them under control, we would fix the country. Well, it was a Democratic Congresswoman. I'm sorry to leave you out of this. I feel really bad. But you got the most comfortable ch chair in the entire place. I was about place. to say, I just got to sit back and enjoy it. It's great. <laughs> so if you got a question or comment, feel free to... Um, the Congresswoman says, don't give Trump's people... Don't, if, you, if they support Donald Trump, challenge them. Find them at the gas station, find them in the supermarket, challenge them, yell at them. No, that'll get you killed. Don't start political fights when people are out shopping for food. Don't start them at a theater. Stop with this already. Actually, sit them down and teach them. That's why I want to hear what you think about Northern Ireland. I want you to teach me what should I know. Frank Luntz, listen, learn, then lead. You need to have people with a big heart, not just a big head. You need to have people who truly want to listen and learn and then lead. They want to hear the points of view that people have before they make their conclusions. And there are people that I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you some names of individuals that you will see over the next uh, Next few, uh, and it's good to see you. I'm so excited for you to be here. I'm going to bring him up in a moment. Um, on the Democratic side, Congressman, uh, uh, Mayor Mitch Landrieu, he was the mayor of New Orleans. He, he uh, lieutenant governor in Louisiana, and now he's in charge of Biden's infrastructure project in Washington, D.C. He is a better retail politician than anyone who I've ever met. He genuinely loves people. He wants to hear from them. He wants to know what's going on with them. How you doing? When he asks you a question, how you doing? He actually wants an answer. And if he can help you do better, he will do it. Cory Booker, he was the uh, Republican, uh, Democrat uh, Senate, Senator from New Jersey. Ran a horrible campaign. Didn't even make it to Iowa. But I think he has the potential if he runs the way that he used to be. So look for Cory Booker's speeches from 10 years ago when he was mayor of New Jersey. And you'll see someone really impressive. Michael Bennett, who's one of the more boring U.S. senators, so filled with substance and so empathetic to the people that he serves, particularly as a former ed ed education czar in Colorado. These are great people. That can change politics as we know it. On the Republican side, uh, the senator from South Carolina, Tim Scott, African-American, gave the uh, State of the Union response to Joe Biden. He doesn't know a negative campaign. He doesn't know to be critical, to attack. He's so impressive because he's all positive. And Ben Sass, the senator from Nebraska, incredibly smart, probably the smartest member of the Senate, and he's more interested in family than he is in policy. So he's interested in what do we do to give moms and dads uh, a greater involvement in the lives of their kids. These are five people who would never, ever run anything like a Trump campaign or a Biden campaign. Those people can change politics as we know it. Lunch on social media. Uh, we can't even come to an agreement. There are now some congressional Republicans that I keep thinking or feeling that they support Putin more than they support Zelensky. I've never seen anything like this before. Things that I took for granted as recently as two years ago are now proven not to be true today. Um, I don't think that there's that self-reflection that is so important in democracy. And that's because of social media. The two issues for social media, three actually. Number one is there's no accountability. So you can write and say anything you want to and there's no way to, to prove it. There's, 
you can have fact checkers and other fact checkers challenge that. Number two is that there is an anonymity and so you aren't punished for tearing somebody apart. And I think that's a problem. And then number three, we reward the negative much more than the positive. We circulate the negative. We, we, we celebrate it. You get likes for ripping someone apart rather than for praising them. And the combination of those three is just horrific for how we communicate to each other. And that's all your generation. And, I, and that's part of my frustration. I don't know how to get around it. And that's why, why my head explodes. Because I can't fix it. I, I, I'd like to think that I could get somebody elected president. I'd like to think that I could help a party achieve the majority. I'd like to think that I could push, promote an issue, or calm people down and bring them together, which I've done. I just did a show with Dr. Phil, three and a half hours. We had college Democrats, college Republicans, similar to this environment, really charged. And we brought people together. And I know this. I filmed that at my house, 50 students in my living room. And they walked outside after it was done, and they all made appointments with each other. They all made time to get together for a meal and to follow up and to engage each other. And they've started to do it. I can do that. I can't figure out how to change hate and anger. And that's blowing my brain. Lunch on Northern Ireland. If there's hope, it's here. I, I don't hold, so, social media is the vehicle, and I believe the vehicle's awful. But in the end, it's not the vehicle that kills, it's the driver. And that is why I try to do sessions like this. This is why I want to go across the globe teaching. I don't have an answer for you. And I'm determined to find one and I keep waiting, I, I now take notes on this thing. I used to get really angry when people would pick it up during a speech or presentation, now I do it myself. I'm desperately searching for the solution. But if you have been so radicalized that you write people off, you've been so radicalized that you cancel people for alternative points of view, or you take professors who agree with you, or you can't stand being challenged, then I don't know how to reach you. And that is my mission for whatever time that I have left. Um, I, what you all ha have been through, what your society has been through, is just so mind-blowing to me. I came here, the first time I came to Northern Ireland, which is the first time I came to a hospital here, was on the first anniversary of the Battle of um, you know, the Anglo-Irish Agreement. And I went to Portadown just to see what sectarianism looked like. And I, it was awful. I'm like, fuck, it was awful. The Catholics were at the end of the street, almost like what I saw in the movie. And they had a barrier, and they wanted to get at the Protestants, and they were blocked from the streets. And they're jumping up and down and just determined to do it. The RUC was there shooting rubber bullets, which hurt at the Protestants, and I watched the Orange Men march and instigate the kids to fight their fight. I never, I didn't understand it. Americans don't know this. I was so angry about it. And the worst thing of all was I saw mom take her carriage with a baby in it, drive it up to the tank, and kept challenging the, t the tank because the tank was moving forward and the vehicles were moving forward because they were trying to take control of the center of Portadown. And she was trying to get her child run over, trying to get the vehicle to run over the carriage so that they could all scream and holler and go attack the RUC. I watched it. I took pictures of it. They took my camera and they took the film. I, that, I don't understand that. And so when I see that you have had almost a quarter of a century and you've gotten out of that, you're the country, you and South Africa have done more in reconciliation than anyone else. So if there's hope, there's here. It's here. But 
I also know, as I know in Lebanon, I spend a lot of time there, that it's fake. In Lebanon, the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians hate each other, and they still rip, rip each other apart. And I know that it was all on the surface, and underneath it was much, much worse. I pray that you all see an understanding and want some sort of reconciliation and a revitalization of humanity in this community. Because you're right, this place could be awesome. So I wish you well. I appreciate this offer. This would be the best thing. The fly just made it up to me. <laughs> this would be the, the, the coolest thing that I've done. I hope that the election, I hope that all of you get the election result you want. And I do know that you'll all end up with the election result that you deserve. <laughs> so thank you guys very much. With thanks to Dr. Frank Luntz. Video and podcast produced by at QUB Engagement. For further information, visit qub.ac.uk slash public hyphen engagement. Views expressed by participants in this program do not necessarily reflect the positions of Queen's University Belfast. <laughs>